Good evening. Hi. As Yolanda said, my name is Amy Blankenship. I'm an attorney at Coolidge Wall. I practice primarily in public sector work. I've represented cities since I started practicing about 12 years ago. I love the work. I love the zoning work. Planning commission meetings and BZA meetings are my thing. I enjoy it. That may sound crazy to you, but hopefully most of you agree with me since most of you sit on boards and commissions like this. Um, board Zoning jokes and land use jokes are few and far between, so when I find them, I hold on to them. Obviously, this picture is a little outdated. He hasn't had hosted the Daily Show for many years, but um, once upon a time, there was an issue out in, I think, North Dakota, and the federal government was involved, and it was this big land use issue, and it made federal news, or made national news, and uh, John Stewart got a hold of it and did a whole segment on it. And in the end, he referred to the whole story as Harry Potter and the intricacies of land use, the worst Harry Potter ever, were his exact words. So hopefully at the end of all this tonight, you won't agree with him too much. Um, we're going to talk about land use law, and I'm not... Please do not let me talk straight for two hours. If you have, no one needs to listen to that. If you have questions, raise your hand or just shout them out and we can discuss things as we go because as we talk about real world examples and things that you'll want to know when you're running meetings and um, when you're analyzing different applications, if you have a question that occurs to you, then ask it. It'll, all make, it'll make this all so much less painful if we you know, have a bit of a dialogue as we go along. I told my kids this morning before I left the house that I wouldn't be home for dinner tonight because I was doing this seminar and I was going to talk for two hours about land use law. And my six-year-old said to me, oh, those poor people. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I would have expected that out of my older one, but out of her, I was actually kind of proud. It was, you know, well delivered. So, okay, so here's our agenda. We're going to talk a lot about zoning, what it is, why we have it, how we do it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about early case law. So, you know, there's when we talk about the law in Ohio, right, and federal law that applies to us, there's statutory. Is this too loud? I feel like I'm shouting at you. Is it too loud now? Okay. Um, there's a statutory law, which is the Ohio Revised Code, right? Those are the, the um, laws that our legis legislature writes here in Ohio uh, that we all abide by. And where when you get pulled over and the cops cite you for things, it could be under the Ohio Revised Code that you may be getting charged with something. Or it could be under a local code, right? We also have our local codified ordinances when you're in a municipality. Um, so those are the two different types of law that you might apply to you through both our statutes and our local laws. But then there's also case law, which is exactly what it sounds like cases that went up through the courts, and then a decision was rendered, um, and those decisions have precedential value, right? So we all work underneath these cases until, if and until they get overturned, they're the law of the land, many of them, and uh, we'll talk about some of the really important ones tonight, because case law is how, really, we got to the point of where we are now with the zoning and what you're able to do with your boards and commissions in your communities. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your considerations as public officials. If you're sitting in this room, I'm going to bet you are a public official. So please don't think when you hear things about ethics or you know, considerations that other public officials get and things people get in trouble with, you read start stories in the Dayton Daily News, that applies to all of you, not just city council members. So if you sit on a BZA or you sit on a planning commission or your city staff, you're still, um, there's certain ethics laws and um, considerations that you're going to want to remember do apply to you. And if you ever have a question about that, ask, right? Always best to ask the question if you think there's an issue ahead of time. Um, and then we'll go through some planning commission and BZA discussions. We're going to talk about uh, maybe more than you'd care to about variances, especially if you sit on a planning commission. But Variances are tricky and they're something that everyone should understand, so we'll spend some time um, talking about those and how they operate. So yeah, I mean, and this sounds really exciting. But um, okay, so the what, why, and how of zoning. If you can read this um, cartoon, oh yeah, and you guys have it all in front of you, okay. Five votes in favor of saving the historic old hotel and one vote for stomping it to bits and eating everyone inside. Again, land use jokes are few and far between. So when you find them, you use them. Um, I do find this one very amusing. So much so that I sent it to the planning director for the city of Oxford because I knew that he would find it amusing. And his comment back to me was so dead on. He said, um, well, I see what's wrong with this picture. Do you? Anyone here see what's wrong with this picture? There's six people slash beasts sitting on that board, right? And you would never have a board of six. Why would you never have a board of six, right? You'd have a board of five or a board of seven because otherwise you're going to have tie votes. And we'll talk about tie votes tonight, but you want to avoid that at all costs, right? So board of seven, board of five, boards of three, you will rarely ever see an even number board, at least not with what we do. Okay, what is zoning? 
Zoning is a legislative act, and that's important. And we're going to talk a lot tonight about legislative versus administrative acts. And the reason why that's important is because that dictates how a court is going to evaluate what you've done. So if a community has taken, everyone in here is with a city, right? Any township people? Oh, there are township people. Great, because I have some slides that are township specific. Anyway, any act that you've taken, then if your city or township is, gets sued, right, which happens, yes? Are we going to have a handout of this? Oh, you should have a handout. I guess I should have said that. Anyone who doesn't have one. Oh, thanks, Yolanda. Yeah, that's okay. it. My Anyone else need one? Anyone else get lasagna on it? <laughs> so, um, zoning is a legislative act, right? And that matters because it, that is how, uh, that's going to dictate how a court looks at the action. It could also dictate which court you end up in, right? When you take an administrative action, such as a variance, we'll get into all of this in more, more detail, um, then you're going to be um, having, there's going to be an appeal of your decision that's taken to court. Legislative act, you just get sued. It's two different things. Um, and if your community has ever been through it, chances are you probably understand it because um, it really only takes once or twice to start to get the lingo of what's happened. Oh, which brings me to a question I wanted to ask. I hate asking people to raise your hands, but for tonight it's helpful. If you are brand new to what you're doing, can you put your hand up? Brand new to a board or commission. Okay, so a fair few of you, great. So um, for some of you that have been doing this for a while, this is all gonna be old hat. The good news is, is I just recently read a study that like the human attention span is about eight minutes. So that's assuming that you have a better than average attention span and that I am more entertaining than average, we can get to about what, 10 or 11? So for those of you that have been doing this a while, you can then zone out. Um, anyway, so it's a legislative act regulating land use and that legislative part is important. You divide your municipality or your township gets divided into districts. I have um, the Oxford zoning map in here. We'll look at some districts in the city of Oxford. And you regulate the buildings and the uses and all of the details that work within those districts, right? You're regulating density and you're regulating how far back buildings have to be set, you're regulating what uses can be in what area, and maybe even what uses can be within a certain number of feet of, an, of other uses, right? Which brings me to almost the best slides I've got. We're going to kind of have the best part of this presentation early, so feel free to go ahead and fill out your evaluation in about five minutes. <laughs> The overall goal of zoning is to avoid incompatible land uses, right? To, to try and avoid nuisance conditions really even before they occur. So you don't, it's terrible to have two neighboring land uses that are terribly incompatible and try and figure out how to work your way out of a problem once it already exists. So that's why we zone. So we don't have to have those problems. Now let's talk about my hometown. Anyone know what town this is? If you're not, don't talk if you're a planner. Anyone know what town this is? Houston, Texas. Famously, the city of Houston has no zoning. Now, I went to college in, in Texas, the University of Texas at Austin, Hook'em Horns, who did not make the tournament, by the way. And yeah, my husband's like, but they're in the NIT. So anyway, um, <laughs> so in Houston, where I grew up, there's no zoning. Friends of mine that are attorneys in Houston take exception when I start talking about these things because they say, well, okay, yeah, we have no traditional zoning, but we use deed restrictions in a way that control things and, and keep things from being incompatible. No, they don't. That's just not true, in my opinion. So three things from growing up in Texas that have permanently um, changed the way I look at the world. One, I have, an, I have a weird, I think, in Ohio, I have a weird outlook on open carry guns. Right? Because where I was growing up, everybody open carried all the time, and it never seemed strange to me. And now up here, I'll often get calls from communities that are like, oh, people are open carrying in our Kroger, what do we do? I, I don't know, don't make them mad, walk away, right? So, so guns, I was like 16 years old before I realized that tar is not a natural occurrence on a beach, because the beaches I'd been to were always in the state of Texas on the Gulf Coast, and they're always covered in tar. Though that's gotten better, thankfully. And three, when I was a kid and we'd come up to Ohio, because my family's all up here, I always, realized, like, I always knew that things looked nicer, things looked different up here. But I was never able to really pinpoint what it was that I was noticing, especially on the interstates. We'd drive down 71 and I'd think, oh, it's so pretty, there's trees and you can see you know, land. Well, the, what I was noticing, but not understanding at the time, of course, is that we have zoning up here, right? We don't build right up on top of our interstates, generally. 
in Houston, it's, it's sort of anything goes, no holds barred. It's a part of this like Texas ideal, I guess, right, of not having the government come in and tell you what you can and can't do, tell you what you can and can't do with your land. Great. But the result of that is you get really weird land uses layered right up on top of each other. So in the background there is Transco Tower. It's the second or third tallest building in the city of Houston. It's not in downtown. It sits out in the middle of nowhere. When you fly in and out of Houston, you'll see it. It's like, what's, that's crazy, right? Not anywhere near downtown, but that's Houston. And then a shopping mall, and then um, you know, a little shop that sells what you would expect based on the name of it. So this kind of thing, every once in a while, the Houston Chronicle, the paper down there, will run articles about what the lack of zoning in Houston means. And that's where I pull all these pictures. They have you know, different examples that they'll run um, about the results of, of there not being any zoning laws to enforce. This is very cringeworthy but it makes my point very well. That man in the Longhorn hat, by the way, is biking by um, the Memorial Crematorium, and that is the crematorium in use, and those are $500,000 townhomes that you can see behind them. So I pulled this up on Google Maps, and just first of all to see if it had survived Hurricane Harvey, it did, this part of town wasn't too badly impacted, and to see if um, I could tell what the setback was of those townhomes. And it's really, really close. I mean, the picture kind of does it justice. You can see, I mean, they're pushed right up behind it. So the crematorium, I would guess, predated them based on the way the buildings look. I didn't dig into it much farther than that. But you know, this to us in Ohio, as we zone and, and talk about planning and comprehensive plans and, and the steps that we take to make sure that things all make sense and that things are cohesive and not incompatible, this seems crazy. Right? What developer in Ohio would say, hey, you know what, let's buy this, let's buy this plat. Let's, let's buy this parcel right here and let's build some $500,000 townhomes. People will love it. Well, apparently in Houston it's not a problem. So my last Houston example, uh, that building on the right is um, condos. It's a high-rise condo building. And those homes that you can see over there on the left are um, single-family homes. I looked those up as well. They're valued anywhere between one and one and a half million dollars. So if that one that's um, covered in the shadow of a, yet another building that's down out of the picture, that one, can you imagine living in that house? I mean, you would have no sunlight. You'd be in constant in shadow for many hours of every day. But again, so yeah, and, it, and if you've been doing this a while, you're going to notice all sorts of things from this picture. You're going to notice what, no setbacks, right? Even between the single family homes, they're pushed right up against each other. Um, and if you're laying out that pool behind it, you're going to be you know, well within uh, earshot of what's going on in that land behind you, but that's Houston. People, nobody down there thinks it's strange. It's just the way it works. So, anyway, that's why we zone. Okay, that's it. That was the high point. Do your evaluations. <laughs> it's not going to get any more interesting after that. Um, so this case, and I promise you have my solemn vow. I will not spend too much time talking about case law. I really want it. it makes people's eyes glaze over. It's very boring. I mean, not to me. I kind of get a kick out of it, but that's what I do. So. This particular case is interesting because it was decided in 1926, it was decided by the United States Supreme Court. So now we're not in Ohio Supreme Court here, we're in the United States Supreme Court, which is a big deal. Um, and it's for Euclid, the town up near Cleveland, right? So it was an Ohio zoning ordinance that got taken, um, got litigated all the way up through the United States Supreme Court. And this case was huge for Ohio, right? This case said, well, for the country, but this case said that um, up until this point, Cities had been handling these incompatible land uses, neighboring land uses. Cities have been handling them with like nuisance law, right? You, is it a public use, nuisance or a private nuisance? And um, they, had, they had some, maybe occasionally they would say things like, well, if you're going to run a slaughterhouse, you have to be such however many feet away from a home. Or, you know, or if you're going to run another big one before zoning codes became the norm was um, gunpowder storage, right? The, yeah. Businesses that were storing, of course, in Houston, you probably could put it anywhere. Um, people that businesses that were storing gunpowder had to be a certain amount, a certain distance from single-family homes. That was sort of the um, <clears throat> first phase of what we would consider zoning, right, in America. The first phase was that part, like regulating little things like slaughterhouses, not little, but certain things like slaughterhouses and gunpowder storage. But then we get to this. So Euclid had a zoning ordinance. They enforced it. They got sued. All the way to the United States Supreme Court. I'm not going to read the whole slide to you, but you know they talk in here about how like a man has a right to build a fire trap, right? 
but then other people have a right to not have their property subject to that peril. And that makes a lot of sense. You've got to balance it, right? You've got to balance what the rights are that I have with my property against his property next door and you know, what I could be doing that could be affecting him and his, va his land value. So it's, the United States Supreme Court upheld the zoning ordinance of Euclid. And um, OK, so they said it was a valid exercise of authority that um, the uh, restrictions bore, this is key, a rational rel relation to health and safety of the community and that the burden of proof was on the party attacking the ordinance, right? So the person suing the city had to prove that they were suffering all these ill effects that they alleged. And the court said, no, we're gonna allow this, right? We're gonna allow cities to do this and moving on into the future, that was it. Then, after that, um, zoning codes all over Ohio were enacted. We're in the mid-1920s at this point when this case was passed. And um, cities all over Ohio passed zoning codes. Interestingly, the city, is anybody here from the city of Cincinnati? Cincinnati had, I believe, and if there's a planner in the room who knows differently, but I think they had the first comprehensive plan in the country in the city of Cincinnati. Yes, and the um, attorney who, for the city, the law director for the city of Cincinnati, who um, was, you know, drafted that plan and was instrumental in that happening, also had written a brief to the United States Supreme Court in support of Euclid in the case that we just talked about. And he is now credited um, with, you know, having a big, you know, uh, impact on the court and swaying them towards the position that they took, that zoning codes were A-OK -okay as long as it wasn't an abuse of power. So how do we zone? We use a zoning code and zoning maps. I'm going to spend very little time tonight on zoning codes. We'll talk about things like conditional uses and variances and some of that later, but I don't, we're not gonna, I'm not going to go through the details of what a zoning code should contain. Whatever your zoning code contains for the jurisdiction where you ser serve on a board or commission, that's what your zoning code contains, right? And don't be afraid of it, read it. But also, you know, don't underestimate the value of your city staff. So wherever you are on a board or a commission, wherever you, whatever you're getting ready to analyze, be it a variance, conditional use, rezoning, whatever, before you do that, you're gonna get some type of staff report. And that staff report is gonna give you the background information that you need probably cite to the sections of the code that are relevant, right? And that staff report is key. Start there, read it. And the sections of the code, if they're not cited in that staff report, then go ahead and pull your zoning code and read the sections. And if you have questions, ask, right? So as you start your process of working on these boards or commissions, it may in the beginning sound like Greek, right? I mean, a lot of this stuff is very land use specific. But the longer you do it, the more it becomes second nature to the point where a seasoned BZA member can tell you the Duncan standards better than I can. So read your staff reports. Read your zoning code in bits and pieces. Don't feel the need, in my opinion, don't feel the need to do a huge deep dive into your code, right, and try and take it all in at once. That's not helpful to anyone. Um, but in the bits that you need it, use it. Zoning maps, <laughs> I love zoning maps. Somebody told me once, an attorney who represents mostly developers, Anybody here from the city of Mason? He told me once that he thinks that um, the city of Mason must have put their zoning map up on a wall and sat down with darts and just thrown them at that map to figure out what uh, districts should be where, because to him there was no rhyme or reason to it. Never practiced in Mason, I can't speak to the truth of that. But this is Oxford's, and to the untrained eye, it could look like you could make an argument that's the same thing, right? That it, it, there's no rhyme or reason to it but there is, and as you get into, it's hard to see in your packet, I know it on here, but in, as you get into the, of course, Oxford, Ohio is where Miami University is, so that blue district over to your right is the MU district, Miami University, so that's where the university sits, and then immediately adjacent to it is a lot of residential use, right, and that residential use is then chopped up into all these different codes that you see, R2MS, R1MS, all of that is dictating things like what density, right? That's th saying things like you can only have a single family home on this lot, or you can have a duplex, or you can have a multifamily. It's also gonna talk, those different districts may all have different setback requirements. They may all have different lot coverage requirements. They, they do all have different requirements. And so all of this is, has been finely tuned and honed over the years, right? And so even though zoning maps may initially seem like total chaos, they're not. There's a, there's a lot of thought and process that goes into these in determining what's in what district. And if there's a real problem with the zoning map, if something is really messed up and is zoned in a way that it just shouldn't be, then you change it, right? 
then there can be a rezoning. You go through that legislative process to rezone the land. Um, and every, you know, there's, this happens all of the time. It's not uncommon for conditions surrounding an area to change and for rezonings to come um, through the process of a planning commission and a city council. And then, you know, change the color on your map and you've got your new uses and you move forward. But anyway, so the zoning map for your community, wherever it is that you are um, working now as either a commission member or board member or staff, I encourage you to get familiar with your zoning map. Have a general idea of what you're looking at. If there's a part of town that you're not familiar with, go drive around it, right? So that when the applications come in and you see, oh, where are we? Into? Yeah, all right, I've been over there. General idea what the uses are, general idea of the feel of the area. That's, in my opinion, a better approach than driving to a property every time you have an application in front of you. I'll get to that a little while later, but Having an idea of the different districts and what that is, just in general, is, um, is definitely helpful to you as a board or commission member. I forgot to give my disclaimer, so let me give that now. I am an attorney. This is not legal advice, right? This is offered simply in the form of education. Right, Jerry? <laughs> this is not legal advice. Please don't construe it as such. And I believe anything I say. And if you have a specific question, take it to your legal counsel. All right. Okay, so... This is all very exciting stuff. Considerations for public officials. We're gonna talk about your meeting procedure, some different things that get people caught up when you're in a meeting. I'm gonna do the show of hands thing again, I'm so sorry. For those of you who sit through either planning commission or BZA meetings, please raise your hand if there is not an attorney in the room when you do it. Okay, so you got, none of your communities have your attorney attend your BZA or planning commission meetings. Okay, which is fine, every community does it differently. Right, and typically communities that start to get sued a lot out of certain boards or commissions, maybe they'll change that. But um, it's helpful to know if you don't have an attorney in the room because then there's a, certainly a responsibility, right, on the part of that board and on the chair Just to know what to do. Are you saying the city attorney or an attorney? <laughs> I'm talking about the city attorney. If you have attorney. Would you ask a question again? I mean, I'm curious because, you know, there may be an attorney on the board, but the city attorney is not in, not in the room. So oh, that's an excellent point. Attorney. Also, let me just say that we love it as city attorneys when we have an attorney on the board. Oh. That is, I really do love that. I think that is um, a different, brings a different level of analysis to every application. Okay, rephrasing the question. If you sit on a board or a commission, does your, and your city attorney does not attend your meetings, raise your hand. Okay, so that brought in the back corner. All right, so, um, which I kind of had guessed it did. Where are you guys from? Okay, so um, meeting procedure is everything. Meeting procedure is how you look like you know what you're doing, how the developer or the applicant or whoever it is doesn't feel like they're being um, taken through some haphazard, arbitrary process. If you have a good procedure for your meetings and you know how to run it and move it along relatively smoothly, smoothly. not to say there won't be hiccups, there's always gonna be hiccups. Um, it just brings a level of competence and a level of professionalism that is invaluable in these meetings, right? It's we've all been there. It's very difficult to get through these when, when you're fumbling through the agenda or trying to figure out what the next step should be or how to make a motion. Um, so it may even be helpful to um, have it, the, if the chair is, if you are the chair of your board or commission and you know you have a tricky situation coming up, Sometimes people will ask their city attorney or township council, whoever it may be, to prepare a um, little cheat sheet, right? A, a little cheat sheet about maybe the certain considerations, things they need to keep in mind, how a motion should be made, um, what the motion should contain, things like that. There's nothing wrong with pre-preparing. Don't, you certainly can't make your decision ahead of time, right? Never do that and never give the impression that you've made your consideration ahead of time. An open mind is a beautiful thing. But if you have ideas of how things are gonna head and you have questions about what happens if this happens or what happens if this happens, ask them. Ask them ahead of time. Talk to staff or talk to your attorney and get a general idea before you even get started. Um, so we'll go through rules of procedure and meeting prep and all of that. We're gonna talk about conflicts of interest. Again, everyone in this room is a public official. A um, little bit about ex parte communication and then the dreaded legislative administrative talk. You can't read this one, and I think it's so funny, it's a shame. I love New Yorker cartoons, they're my favorite. All in favor of telling Anderson about that thing stuck to his lips, say aye. I love that one. 
So rules of procedure. That is the guy that gave us Robert's Rules of Order. He was an army man. He drafted Robert's Rules in the 1850s, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, but he did not draft them in a military way. They were never intended to be a reflection of military process or the steps that you would go through in front of a military tribunal. It's very different than that. What he was doing was trying to figure out a way to successfully run meetings at his church. He had been given a leadership role at church and he found the meetings to be chaotic and haphazard and so he drafted Robert's Rules of Procedure, Robert's Rules of Order. We still use it today. Your community may or may not have adopted it. This is a gray area, right? Sometimes when you get into these questions about how to move forward and you say, well, do we technically use Robert's Rules? I, I don't know, maybe, you're not, maybe at some point, somewhere written in the rules of your border commission it says we shall operate under Robert's Rules of Order. Maybe it doesn't. It probably doesn't matter in reality, right? Because you're probably using it anyway. Everyone does, right? And these are the general uh, recognized guides to running these meetings. I sat on the board um, for years at my kid's private preschool, and that's how we ran our meetings, through Robert's Rules of Order. That wasn't me, I didn't do that. I did rewrite the bylaws, but I didn't bring Robert's Rules. That was them, and they'd done it for decades before me. And it's the same reason that we, any of the rest of us use it for any of our meetings, because otherwise you're back in that church meeting with total chaos, right? Um, when I was a kid, I had you know, a little group of friends in the neighborhood, and we were all very chatty. No, that's probably shocking. And we had a trophy. One of my friends had a little soccer trophy. And when we'd all sit together in her room and talk, you had to be holding the trophy to talk, right? And so, yeah, and then you pass the trophy. To, well, when you think about that, it's kind of genius, because otherwise everyone's just talking all over each other. It's the same sort of thing when you're running a meeting, right? When you've got the application in front of you, and you're going to hear from, what? You're going to hear from staff. You're going to hear from the applicant, right? You're going to hear from the public. You're going to have motions made. You're going to have discussion among your board. You're following these rules, whether you're doing it consciously or not. The only time you're really doing it consciously is when something goes wrong, right, or something gets wonky, and then you're trying to figure out how to, how to move forward with the motion. What do we need to do now? All of that. And um, everyone gets tripped up in that. I get tripped. I had that issue just this week in Oxford. We found our way out of it, right? Be sensible and reasonable, find the most practical way forward that's fair to everyone, and then you go with it. Um, and that's the point of these rules, right? To be fair and effective, give everyone an opportunity to speak when, they, um, when it's their time to speak, and, but yet to keep things moving, keep the meeting moving. So when you start your meeting, generally, probably everyone starts with a call to order, right? A roll call, all of that. Um, and then at some point in the beginning of your meeting, you're gonna get to meeting minutes. Read them ahead of time. And if you have issues or you think there's something wrong, raise that issue, ideally, and again, my opinion, ahead of time. Because when the issues get raised at the meeting, well, I think this was wrong because I think this is what happened instead, then it's harder for um, you know, staff to know, well, I wonder how that got changed or how that happened. Raise it ahead of time if you see an issue. Um, and amend them if necessary, right? They can be amended. They're just draft minutes at that point. Until the board or commission votes, then they're just draft minutes, and they can still be amended if there's something that's wrong. But read them. Um, okay, agenda management. Probably consent agendas is not something that any of you are gonna deal with as BZA members or planning commission members. This is something city councils use a lot. Um, they're efficient. They're, you can put a lot of things into a consent agenda, and then things that have need no discussion and that don't need to be amended in any way or whatever, they just need to be approved by council. So you might see a consent agenda and then several items underneath them and then council can take one vote, motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, then everything on there is approved. Um, in the city of Trotwood, when we, do, um, when we do our tax foreclosures, those resolutions will often appear on the consent agenda unless there's a need to pull them off for some reason. If there's something that needs to be discussed, then someone can make a motion to remove it from the consent agenda. But typically, things like that that don't need discussion can just be approved all in one vote. Motion making. I, I move we adjourn for lunch, right? You make a motion, and then someone seconds it, and you move forward. Now, this next bullet point, make motions in the affirmative, I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. Does anyone in here know why that's a problem? Has anyone had that issue where you're like, do I make this in the affirmative? What do I do? The problem is, is when you know you don't want it, right? Whatever is in front of you, you know you're going to vote against it. This is not happening. We've heard all the evidence. No, my, my vote is no. 
then, but then, okay, other people feel differently. If I want to make the motion, how do I make it? Do I make a motion to deny? Okay, then everybody on the board needs to know that if they vote a yes, they're voting it down, and if they vote a no, they're voting it up. Mm -hmm. That's confusing, right? But it's also confusing to make a motion to approve and then vote no. People think that just because they made a motion to approve that they have to vote yes, you do not. Even if you make the motion and you make it in the affirmative, you can still vote no. So making motions in the affirmative, I would say most of the time is, is ideal. Sometimes it does not make sense. Sometimes you're in a weird situation where it makes more sense to, to make a motion to deny. You'll know it when you see it, I'd like to think, right? And if in doubt, make it in the affirmative. I, um, you know, I've seen it bite people both ways because sometimes you, you, council members or board members get confused and um, you just have to remind people, right? Generally, when I'm in a meeting, well, every time when I'm in a meeting and somebody on the council or the board has made a motion to deny, before they start taking the roll call vote, I will say, so just to reiterate so that everybody's on the same page, it's been a motion to deny. So if you vote yes, you're voting against the application. Right, so then that way, once you get to that seventh vote, everybody still knows what you're talking about. Um, it gets confusing. Plus, does everyone in here meet at night? Yeah. Does anyone in here meet like in the seven o'clock hour? Yes, this is Oxford. We meet at 7.30. So you, it can be 11 o'clock, right? If you have a packed agenda, if you, you know, you have a lot of stuff on it. It's 11 o'clock at night and you're sitting there and you've worked all day and now you're working through this agenda and you're trying to give it the full attention that it deserves, but things get confusing um, when you get tired and so um, even the little things like this can trip you up, but make them in the affirmative. I, I see the New Yorker, you can't beat it. So they're tabling the motion. Um, if you decide to table a measure, then you can do it. You can table it, you can table it to a date certain uh, we, you know, you might know that you want to bring it, have it come back at the next meeting, or maybe the applicant is saying, well, okay, I hear your concerns, and I can run that, I can get that study done, but I need a little more time, give me a month, and you can table it out into the future. Whatever you need to do with it, generally speaking. Sometimes there are, there are, um, there are hangups there. So your zoning code might say that a particular application has to be heard within a certain number of days. Well then, does it have to be voted on within a certain number of days? Maybe not, depends on the way your, the way your code is written. So some of that is, um, sometimes that can become an issue. But if you've got legal counsel involved, you can always ask them. Or um, again, it might be something that you notice ahead of time. If it says in your staff report that this has to be done you know, by the 15th of the month and you're meeting on the 12th, then yeah, then maybe you need to go ahead and vote it that night up or down. Something to consider when you're on a BZA or a planning commission is your zoning codes might say, um, I always refer to this as the, the bite of the apple, right? Your zoning code might say that, okay, this is, they've applied for this, whatever it is, PD. And if it's denied, then they can't come back with a similar application for a year. That can, and it's not just PUDs, that can apply to a lot of different things. So if your code says that, be cognizant of that. Right, that if you're getting ready, if the, if the board or commission is going to deny something, the applicant might have to wait a full year to bring something back that's deemed uh, to be similar. The language changes in different, in different towns, townships and uh, municipalities, so you have to read your zoning code, but that's just something to keep in mind. We've seen, I've certainly seen applicants that went ahead and withdrew an application, um, especially like with subdivisions in, um, if, the, if it's a one bite at the apple for, oh shoot, sorry. If it's one bite at the apple for a year, then they will, um, if they see the writing on the wall, right, that it's about to go down, sometimes they'll withdraw the application so that there's not been any negative vote. And then they can come back with a similar application but maybe tweak some of the things that are causing concern for the board or the commission or the residents or whoever. Sure. All right, uh, Heine, they can use their, so if you table a measure. Yeah. Maybe. That's a great question. And no, you're, don't apologize that you're confused because everything I just said was extremely confusing. Maybe. That would be the concern, not so much as they can't bring it back for a year, but if something has to be decided in a certain number of days. 
that's the issue with tabling. If you've got something that says within 45 days of this event, you have to rule on it, then tabling it can be an issue. But maybe, yes, something like that. That's what you'd be looking at, yeah. Absolutely. I, yes. And, and that is, um, you know, that's really critical actually because especially if you have a developer who may be from out of town or, you know, using an attorney that doesn't know your code as well as some of the others might then, they may not know. And if you can give them the heads up, it can be helpful um, if everybody's trying to get onto the same page. And I don't see, I, I never see the harm in giving them all of the information, right? Tell them what the code says. It's not like it's a secret, right? And technically, if they'd done their due diligence, they would know it anyway. So um, I think that's a great idea. And if you know that you're up against something like that, mentioning it in an open meeting, getting it on the record is a great idea. Yes? Are they able to stop midstream? Are they able to make the present that the, so an application comes in for some kind of a variance, or whatever it is, and the, 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 the public comment period is over, and there's a conversation amongst the staff, and the guy sees this isn't going the right direction, mm -hmm. did he then say, stop, I don't want any vote on this at all, and, and just stop? I would never advise a board or a commission to deny that. If the applicant came back to the podium and said, I'd like to, I'd like to withdraw my application, Stop, I don't want to move forward. My advice would always be, that's it, it's withdrawn, move on. And I should never speak in the, in, Jerry, can you think of any other reason why you wouldn't accept that? Well, we had a uh, situation where the city did not particularly want that development. I would think that we may want it to proceed and just be finalized, be voted and be voted down and be done. So see, there you go. Jerry and I represent different municipalities. I would t always tell the city of whoever, Oxford, take it. Yeah, take the withdrawal. He might have d possibly different advice. This is why I should never talk in a conclusive form like that, right? Because everything is fact specific. I, I, have, never told, I have never suggested that they not. And I, as a matter of fact, I don't know that I've ever had a chair um, or a, or a um, board say they didn't want to accept it. That if it was being withdrawn, they've always allowed it to be withdrawn. I mean, we had, we had a matter in Oxford that I think it boomeranged back three, to three or four times. They would come, they'd withdraw, they'd come back, they'd withdraw, and ultimately, but of course, that was something that the city was trying to cooperate with them on and, and move forward. So, yeah. It depends on the word of whatever ordinance you have. Because for the most part, if somebody says, I want to withdraw, they're, they, they're driving the whole process. So right. Withdraw, it's, it's done. I mean, the, you know, it's one of those, again, fact specific examples, right, where you, my concern would be if you denied it, unless you had an ordinance that said you needed to take the vote, right? That you could have the argument later on from the applicant saying in, in the lawsuit that would inevitably be coming, I tried to withdraw and they didn't let me. That's, that would be my concern. Again, this is not legal advice. The Ohio Supreme Court requires me to tell you that. <laughs> Everything is. How can you know that it, how can you know the city doesn't want it unless you have the vote? You don't feel right. it. Right, right. And sometimes you can be surprised. It doesn't happen often, right? But sometimes I'm surprised. Even commissions that I know very, very well, and I expect that I could tell you exactly how every member's gonna vote, sometimes they don't vote the way I expected. So it happens. Things, what's up? It could happen when, for a subdivision, and we decided we wanted them a, a, another route out of the subdivision, and, and the board came up with that, and we might table it. And, sure. Developer and say, hey, this is what we suggest. Right. And then he, so you table it for that too. Right. And that's where, when you're in that interactive process and you're trying to work with the applicant or the developer, who, you know, whoever it is, if you're working together and, and it's, and it's a, a back and forth and a give and take, and maybe some citizens have specific concerns about certain things, and the applicant jumps up and says, oh, we can fix that. You know, we're happy to do this or we're willing to do that. You know, that's where, um, 
a little plug for the city of Beaver Creek, naturally I'm a little biased, but they, that planning commission is very, very good at what they do. And that staff is very, very good at what they do. So when planning staff in Beaver Creek has reviewed an application and it's before the planning commission, I always, I read these staff reports and I look at the application and I think, well, shoot, that looks great to me. I can't think of anything else, right? And then that planning commission will hear it and they'll look at it and they'll say, well, what about this? And the staff didn't think of it. I certainly didn't notice. And the commission came up with it. So then you do. You end up in those interactive discussions where maybe it needs to be tabled or um, even withdrawn and come back because you just never know what a board or commission is going to see. Um, I have a question about pre-hearing for applications. We had a situation that uh, the applicant came to a pre-hearing. And, and whatever my understanding was, that whatever issue planning commission saw would be discussed at the pre-hearing so the applicant would have an understanding. But that didn't totally happen. And so at the hearing, then one of the planning commission members brought up something that I didn't think had a major concern, that I didn't think was brought up in the pre-hearing. And I thought that that was unfair to the applicant to not sort of bring up any concerns that people are aware of on the board in the pre-hearing, can you speak to that? Well, and that's, whenever you have an app, I you're, see so you're talking about something that went through different levels, planning commission and then on to council? A working session. Okay, so like a site review that happens before the hearing. Yeah. Well then, you know, I, no, I, I think that the applicant, if, if it came before the, the commission and the commission saw the issue and raised it, then no, the- They didn't raise it at the work session. Right. But then it was raised at the hearing. Yeah. Yes, I don't know that you would ever be able to um, impose a rule on your border commission that if you didn't think of it at the at the site review stage, that you can't now raise it in the hearing. No, it, I'm sure that it was thought of. It wasn't that. I mean, yes. I think it was thought of. <laughs> right. I think there was an intentionality at holding back and then sort of slamming. It. And then bringing it forward at, at the, the hearing. Yeah. So my question, right. I mean, it's one more of a sort of ethical thing. It's not a legal. Thing. Right, right. And, and there's no way to, again, because um, we can't prove ever what people are thinking, right? We can't, we can't really conclusively establish that something was done in a way to intentionally catch the applicant off guard or, um, or to undermine the application. So yes, if it comes up through the hearing process, fair game needs to be addressed, you know, especially if, you've, um, if you're still at the planning commission level before it's gone on to city council. And even when, they, even when new things come up at council, things that go up from planning commission with a recommendation and then city council decides, sometimes things change at that level, right? And your code may speak to, um, to that process or it may not. And um, every board and commission is gonna see things differently. And every person is gonna see things differently. And when um, an issue comes up, if it has enough traction to get the votes to be part of whatever the ultimate decision is, then it's fair game. So, okay, <laughs> procedural examples. Lack of a second. One of our clients, who shall remain nameless, spent many years in litigation on something that happened because of a motion that lacked a second. So, um, it happens, and there's that, I pin drop moment, right? I certainly felt it the day that it happened that triggered the litigation that we were in for years, where the room was silent. The motion was made, no second, nothing, for like a minute. And then finally it was said, well, it failed for lack of a second. I wasn't representing that board at that time. I was on the other side. Um, so anyway, it does happen. And I was just in a meeting earlier this month or last month, where was that, um, where people, the commission was moving forward on something. It was clear that they all planned to approve it. And it was in Beaver Creek. It was in Beaver Creek at a planning commission meeting. It was clear that they intended to approve what was before them. The issue was how they wanted to condition it. So one member said, um, you know, motion to approve with the 15 conditions listed in the packet and a condition for X, Y, and Z, whatever it was. Well, the rest of the board didn't want to do that. So pin drop, silence. And she said, well, I said, well, it failed for, the motion failed for lack of a second. Okay, fine. Another member made a motion, listed some conditions, silence. 
fail for lack of a second. Then, third time's a charm, we had a motion that everybody, that had a second, everybody voted on, and the measure passed. But, you know, these aren't, um, these aren't moments to take offense, right, or, or be offended by, by what goes on in these meetings. And, and nobody did in Beaver Creek. But, um, you know, when you've got five or seven different people, you've got five or seven different opinions. And as long as you've got a majority vote for something to be approved, then that's okay. Not everybody might agree on whatever the conditions were that the other two members thought maybe they should stick on there. And why did they not want those conditions? Generally because they thought it was all part of staff review and that it would be handled at the staff level. And that's, and that's okay, that's good, right? If you have that faith in your staff that when they're taking it from the, for the administrative steps after you as a board of commission have ruled on it, then, now you're laughing, so let's hope that doesn't mean you don't have faith in your staff, but I will suggest that. But um, generally, if staff says to you, right, if you have a planning director who can come to the podium and say, I understand your concern, but I wouldn't worry about it too much because when I do this level of review, I'm gonna have to require this, that, and the other, and that'll take care of it. You can put some faith in that, right? So um, anyway, don't take offense if you have a mo make a motion and there's no second. And if you're in a meeting and that happens, the motion fails for lack of a second, easy. Tie votes, that's trickier. Um, you have, as I mentioned before, ideally you sit on a board of five or seven, but people get sick and people take vacations and you know people have things that they have to go to and they can't always make every single meeting. So you might be sitting with a room of four or six. And then maybe you've got the vote and it's a tie. Well, what do you do? It did not pass, right? Tie votes don't approve it, it failed at that point because you have to have a majority vote for something to pass. There, you can make a motion to reconsider. Somebody on the board who voted in the winning column, in the case of a tie vote, it would be somebody that voted no. They could make a mo if they had been on the fence and thought maybe they'd change their vote, they could make a motion to reconsider and have it brought up again and they could change their vote. And that's okay, you know, I mean, it, you're, if you're on the fence, if something's really close because you see this side and you see that side and you think, well, then maybe this happens. It's extremely rare. It should be extremely rare, right? Tie votes should be extremely rare. A motion to reconsider should be even, I mean, it should just very rarely ever be an issue that you face. But it's out there. If you ever needed it, it's a tool for your consideration. Where do you find that rule? Is that in Roberts? It's in Roberts Rules. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's in Roberts Rules. And it's, um, oh, and I forgot to point out that this cartoon, all the women are raising their hands and it says, well, then it's unanimous. Um, so, yes, it's in Robert's Rules of Order. And if your legal counsel for your community tells you you can't do that, then don't, right? Um, but generally, I think it's an, it's an approach that's relatively accepted. It can be done um, and it might get you out of that issue. Now, another issue is, our consideration is, again, you've got the issue in your zoning code. If, you, if you're right up against the wall on something in terms of timing and you have to hear it that night, then you can't consider you know, tabling it to another meeting. But sometimes in situations, if, it's, if we've got a commission and several of them have the flu or something has happened and a lot of them are gone, then there have certainly been times where before the meeting we've said to the applicant, hey, heads up. You're going to have to have 100% of the votes up here to get this to pass. If you want to wait, we're going to offer you the opportunity to just table it tonight and bring it back next month. That does not always work. You may have something in your code that says you have to hear it because you, know, you have to hear it within 45 days or whatever. But if it's not in there, extending that um, opportunity, right? Again, we're in that interactive process of working with an applicant, then maybe you want to consider saying, just, you know, just so you know, um, we've done this before in Oxford. We have a BZA there of five members, and every once in a while, you know, we'll have a commission of three. And they're going to have to have, I'll discuss this later in the slides, but in order for a variance application to pass, they have to have 100% yes, right? Every member of the board is going to have to vote yes. So um, if we can and if it's acceptable to the applicant if they want to, we'll extend that before the meeting. Hey, heads up, we're only going to have the three tonight. Do you want, to, you want to push this off for another month? So every community does that a little differently. I don't think there's any um, law against it. I have encouraged members that missed the work session but were able to attend the regular meeting to say on the record, I missed the work session. 
I read the transcript, or I watched the video, or I, um, you know, I've, I've, whatever you could have done, listen to the audio if the clerk has it or whatever, to say that I missed it, but I, I know everything that went on. I heard all of it. Um, so if you can do that and you can bring yourself up to the speed to the point where, you know, the applicant wouldn't have the, or citizens or whoever might be adverse to what's about to happen could say, you shouldn't have voted. You didn't know what you were talking about. Fix it. Just fix it in open meeting and say, I, I, this is what I did to make sure that I was up to speed. So when I just said the thing about listening to the recording, it made me think of um, a story that I like to tell when I give these presentations. An attorney at a local firm, ps &E, um, once said to me, can we have, I was representing another city that I don't work with much anymore. This was years ago. He sent me an email and he said, can we have, he made a public records request. He was representing a developer. Can we have the video of the, whatever it was, planning commission meeting? And I responded to him and I said, you know, City ABC doesn't take videos of their meetings. So he responded and said, okay, fine. Then can I please have the audio recording of what went on at that meeting? City ABC does not take audio recordings of their meetings. So he wrote me back and said, may I please have the stone tablet and chisel that the clerk <laughs> used to hammer out their minutes? Um, yeah, but there's no, this isn't in my presentation time, it's really not even relevant. There's no, re there's no requirement in an Ohio law that you have to record your meetings. It is good practice, generally everybody does, but there's no actual requirement that you have to do it. Okay, quorum. So this is where the thing I was talking about a minute ago about the three members in BZA, this comes into play. So what it, you have to have a quorum to hold a meeting. Generally, a quorum is a majority of the board members. That's not always true. There can be tricky things written into rules that say a quorum shall be considered five of the seven or, or whatever it is. But if it doesn't say that, then for example, in that Oxford BZA example, we have five members. If only three people show up, we can hold the meeting. But in our rules in the BZA for Oxford, it says, it might be even in the ordinance, it says that um, you have to have a vote of three to approve a variance. So it doesn't say you know, that you have to have a majority, because a majority of three, of course, is two. But it just says that you have to have a vote of three. So that's where I get back to that. I'll say to an applicant before a meeting, hey, you've got three members up there. You're going to have to have all of them agree with you to get this approved. If you wait till next month and you have five, your percentage chance uh, goes up, right? So um, be aware of special rules that might apply to both when you have a majority and when, I mean, when you have a quorum and when you might need to have more than just a majority number to approve a measure. Okay, raise your hand if you're a chairperson. Don't be shy. Okay, you guys have a lot of responsibility. And I am generally always so impressed in meetings when, with the chair people running their meetings, right? Like this is, this, it's all on them. It's their show to just move everything forward and take the right steps and go in and decide when somebody jumps up and says, well, can I talk right now? Can they? It's up to the chair, right? So um, you're the ones that are running the meeting. You have some certain responsibilities you need to think about. You need to recognize speakers. And if you have a time limit, um, some communities will run a time limit on people. They'll say you have three minutes to speak or God help us all five minutes to speak, right? Then um, do, you give, you give, do you give five minutes? Oh, okay. Then um, if you, it is hard to make people stop. And don't be shy. If you're the chair and their time is up, Put it, you can put a stop to it, that's okay, as long as you do that for everybody, right? Anybody that gets up to speak and they run over their time. And if you've got a really heated hearing, right? If you've got the standing room only, every citizen is there, they're all bent out of shape about what's happening for one reason or another, then um, say it at the beginning, right? There's a time limit for, um, we're gonna hear from the public, there is a time limit, everyone gets three minutes to speak or five minutes or whatever it is, and, and we will enforce that. So please keep your comments to three minutes. If your community allows people to give time, that's fine, right? Then somebody else in the audience can say, I'll, I'll give them my three minutes, and then they can speak for six or whatever. So um, all of that's okay, but do it equally. Don't do it to one person and not to another. That really gets people bent out of shape, right? When you interrupt them and say, your time's up, sit down, and they say, well, you let her talk for 10 minutes. Um, so if somebody didn't donate their time to them, be careful, do it equally um, and enforce it to everyone. Keeping your members on track. This is tricky, and um, sometimes you know I feel as though 
share people don't want to, they don't want to seem rude, right? You don't want to say to someone, why are you talking about this right now? That's not the topic on the table. But it's okay to say that, right? Do it in a professional manner and say, okay, yes, and we will get to that, or maybe you won't, but that's what right now we need to be addressing this and bring people back to the topic on hand. Keeping them on track is the responsibility of the chair, you know? I mean, sometimes I will occasionally jump in if I'm in a hearing and I've got a council or a commission that's gone way off base, right? Then sometimes you can gently suggest, uh, Mr. Chair, you know, let's bring it back to where we are. But generally, it's gonna be up to the chairperson, right? To keep everything where it needs to be. <coughs> know your limitations. What I mean by this is exec sessions, work sessions, you, um, for those of you that sit on BZAs, do any of you go into an executive session to do your deliberations? No. You do? No. Okay, so this is interesting. When I do the seminars like this in Columbus, people that are, that are from northern Ohio, communities north of 70, a lot of them go into an exec session as a BZA to deliberate. Yeah, right? That just seems so foreign to me. Jerry, do any of your communities go into an exec session to deliberate? And smaller, yes, they will do that as well. Right. <coughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. When you are on a BZA and you need to deliberate about a decision, under Ohio law, you have the right to go into an exec session. It's, it's in this part of the state, it's rare. Uh, you just don't see it a lot. Um, none of my communities do it. I would be, um, you know, if we start, if, if any of them wanted to start it, we need to give it some thought. How are we going to do this? Are we going to do it on every single variance request? Um, but exec sessions are very specific, right? They're um, under the Ohio Revised Code, again, our state law, there's certain reasons why you can go into an executive session. And if you have gone into one, the only other reason generally that planning commission or board members BZA members might go into an exec session is to appoint officers. Sometimes people will go into an exec session to do that. Even that's not very common, but can be done. So anyway, if you, yes? <clears throat> How do you initiate one? I mean, like, say you were, you were uh, not a totally uh, up to speed, say, on the issue and mm -hmm. you wanted to discuss it further. Is, is the individual board or member tell the, Chairman, can you like to go in and it, or, or is it, so how do you do it? Do you have an attorney that sits in your meetings? No. I would never do it. Okay. Because unless it's something that's been discussed and approved ahead of time, you could be running afoul of like 15 different ways when you run into it. I have a slide on it here somewhere, but I, I'm not there yet, I guess. Um, you could be running afoul of a lot of different issues when you go into an exec session. They have to be done in a very specific way to be an illegal, I mean, to be a legal executive session. Um, so. If you ever do go in one, and you've gone through all the steps, and you've had a little legal counsel as to how to do it, when you're in that exec session, you cannot talk about anything else but the topic that's in front of you, and you can't vote. You can't um, make a decision behind closed doors, right? This is all sunshine law stuff. We're gonna talk about this more here now, getting into open meeting considerations, but the idea in Ohio, right? Ohio sunshine law, public records law, and open meetings law, the idea is that the work of our government is done out in the open, in the sunshine, right? That we have a right to know um, what is going, what the how the decisions are made, what information they have in front of them, all of that, except for these very specific exceptions. So I used to work with a person who does this kind of work, and she used to say that in her opinion, local municipalities, at least in Ohio where we all operate, are held to such a high standard of transparency. But yet, you know, you try and figure certain things out with the federal government, good luck. But at least where you're concerned, at the local level, it's a high level of transparency. You're expected to do things out in the open. So, open meetings. I, I love this cartoon, right? Old days, right, when meetings behind closed doors, wink, wink, nod, nod, and now how an open meeting can be, uh, open meetings can be violated with the, what, laptop and texting and all that. So, you have to make your decisions in the open. You have to do all of your deliberating in the open. Again, that weird little exception for BZAs that none of you do, so don't worry about it. Uh, you have to do all your deliberating in the open. Everything needs to be in the sunshine. So don't ever sit up there and text each other, right, during a meeting. I love that you're laughing because hopefully the fact that you're laughing means that you would never, ever consider doing that. 
it happens. It's been litigated up through the courts in Ohio, right? That one member texted another during the meeting and said, we need to vote on this this way because of whatever, or I need to know what the fire chief says about this, that, and the other. No, no, you cannot do that, right? In the open. It's no, um, it's no less illegal to do that than it was to go behind closed doors and make deals that should have been made out in the open, right? Um, the other idea behind all of this, which has now been litigated in Ohio, is reply all to an email. Don't do it, right? If, you have a, if staff sends your commission an email and says, hey, heads up, commission members, here's what's coming, then they give you some information that you need to have ahead of time, that's okay. You've received the information from staff. That email is a public record, and if somebody wanted it, they could have it, right, if they asked for it. If you reply all, and all of your commission members are on that email, and give any type of um, you know, indication that could be like a, a deliberation or a discussion of the issue or what you think should happen or how you would vote, you're violating the Open Meetings Act. Reply all is dangerous, don't do it. This also applies to like Facebook, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't speak terribly competently to how it works, but I think there's a way to have conversations with people, and maybe even more than one person at a time, that could also be a violation of the Open Meetings Act. If you aren't doing it in a, meet, in a properly advertised meeting and out in the open, then you have to be thinking about this. So what is a meeting? Under Ohio law, a meeting is a prearranged gathering attended by a majority of the members of your board, so three if you're a five, four if you're a seven, that's arranged for the purpose of discussing and deliberating your public business, right? This has been, in certain cases in Ohio, this definition has been interpreted pretty I don't want to say loosely, but it has been interpreted in a way uh, that could cause um, meeting for drinks with a majority of the members of your board into an open meetings violation, right? Because if you, um, I did a seminar like this once, and I had a woman come up to me afterwards, and she was a township trustee, and that tends to be township trustees or three, and one of the other township trustees was her best friend. And she said, you know, we have coffee together every morning. And we talk about everything, all the township business. Is that an open meetings violation? Probably, yeah, right? She had a majority of members at a prearranged gathering. She was talking about public business. So you need to be careful of this. You need to be cognizant of this. Um, if I am standing around at a commission meeting after the fact, I will watch and wait for the commission members to start to leave. Uh, because if four or more of them stay and continue to discuss something, uh, not so much of an issue if it's something that was already decided, but I still don't love it. Then I'll say to them, hey guys, let's, you know, not talk business, right? Because you never want to run afoul of this. These laws exist for a very specific reason. And if you do mess up under them, then it can have ramifications that can undo the decisions that you made and call into question, um, you know, the, the process that your community took. Nobody wants to be there. So um, also under open meetings considerations, there is a case in Ohio that talks about round robin being a violation. This one's tricky. Um, so it was a case out of Cincinnati. It was when they were looking to build the um, Reds stadium, I believe, the new Reds stadium. Who threatened to leave? The Reds or the Bengals? Bengals, yeah. Okay, so it was the Bengals, I think. And the city manager was uh, needing to have meetings with his, commission, his city commission members to talk about whether they would be in support of certain um, tax things they were gonna do right to keep them here and, and build that stadium. Anyway, he scheduled meeting after meeting after meeting with individual commission members. So you come in at nine and you come in at 9.30 and you come in at 10, that is a violation of the Open Meetings Act, or at least according to the, to the court it was, right? So um, round robin stuff can be tricky. I don't mean to deter you from talking to your other commission members. It's natural, it's normal, it's gonna happen, it's okay. You just have to be mindful of these things that um, you don't wanna do it in such a way that you're running afoul of the open meetings laws. You had a question? On the way to the car, can you say anything about the meeting that just happened? Sure, if it's you and one other member, of course. You and two other members, well, how big is your board, five or seven? Five. Okay, so if it's you and one other member, you're fine. If it's you and two other members, then you've got a majority and you could maybe be running afoul of this. Now, that's being, that's being extremely um, cautious, right? Lawyers are very risk averse. So that, that's being extremely cautious to take that position. But at the end of the day, why risk it, right? Why let anyone say, I heard them, 
talking about the case, and so they decided ahead of time what they were going to do, or they decided whatever. So anyway, keep it in mind. And if you have questions, talk to your legal counsel, because this is not legal advice. Okay, executive sessions. We talked about this. I said earlier there's like some really limited um, permissible reasons under the Ohio law as to why you can go in an exec session. I am not going to go through them all right now, um, but they are specific and they're meant to be specific and they're not meant to be vague and it's not meant to be, oh, well, this probably meets that one, so let's go into an exec session. No, no. If it, there's a new, new ish one for economic development, and I'm hearing a lot of people thinking, that that economic development one does more than it actually does. That's a very specific um, section of the code. And you have to meet some, ser some um, bullet points, right, before you can go in for an economic development executive session. Again, none of that, that may not apply to you. Before you go into one, you do a roll call vote, right? It's not done by, um, it, it's not done by just general acclamation. You have to take it one by one. Everybody has to do the roll call vote to go in. Don't get off topic. Don't make decisions. And the making decisions thing too also applies to work sessions, right? So work sessions are obviously different than exec sessions. You're in an open meeting, it's been advertised, people can show up if they want, um, but you still should not make any decisions in, until you're in a regular session, in a regular meeting. Oh, I like this cartoon too. Let's not forget the public's desire for transparency is balanced against our need for concealment. <laughs> that is not the law. Um, work session, I understand, but part of the benefit of a work session is to let the applicant know kind of where you're in, and whilst it's not a vote, Correct. Is, it not a, is it not okay to say, is it okay to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of what's happening? So, X? yes, I mean, individual members, um, while I would, of course, prefer everyone to not say I'm not in favor, or I love this, and we'll definitely vote for it. I would, I would love for commission members to steer clear of that and stick more to the, um, my biggest concern is, right? What I'm seeing is the issue is, and if you could tweak this, then I would think I'd feel better about this whole application. Things like that, yes, that's all okay in work sessions. It's helpful to the applicant, um, but it's not making the decision. Because you really, again, an open mind is a beautiful thing. You should not be making any decisions until you've had the regular meeting, you've had the hearing, everything's been presented to you. Um, and and then you're going to move forward with it, right? So yes, anything that would sh suggest in that work session that you have concerns about the application and things that you'd like to see differently, that's OK. That's OK. OK, meeting prep. Um, I've alluded to all of this already, but I, I can't stress um, the importance of reading everything ahead of time and, and preparing by going through what's been given to you by staff, looking at the application, having a general idea of what the code sections are that are relevant and what questions you might have. You can call staff, you can talk to them about it beforehand. Um, they should be open and available to you generally. Um, and you know, if you go into a meeting and you're prepared and you've been through the packet and you've had your questions preliminarily answered by staff, then you can really focus on what's exactly in front of you and um, what your concerns are and whether you're in support or not of the application. If you don't do that ahead of time and it's all new to you, then sometimes it can be, you know, information overload, taking it all in for the first time. It's, uh, it's extremely helpful to be, it's helpful to everyone, the applicant and the board, if you do all this beforehand. Oh, I mentioned earlier about driving by the site. Your impressions or your opinions of what the site can or should look like or what the, what the site can or should hold in terms of size or whatever is probably not evidence, right? What's evidence is what's given to you in the hearing. So if you do drive by the site, that's okay. But I would, I would caution everyone from relying on that too heavily when you're giving your reasoning as to why you're voting one way or another um, to say, well, I drove by there today and I thought there were too many cars parked on the street or whatever your concern might be. That, that's not really, um, that, that is not evidence in front of you. And so though you may have seen that and you might have felt like that's an issue, then address the parking in the meeting, not your own personal impressions of what the street looked like at five o'clock when you drove by. Okay, everyone in this room is a public official. Before we talk, we have like 45 minutes left. Before I go into conflicts of interest, does anyone want or need a break? No? Should we just keep going? Okay. Conflicts of interest. I'm not going to read this to you, but this is a section of the Ohio Revised Code that you need to be thinking about. Um, there's other sections too, but this is a big one. You are a public official. 
And what comes with that, that is not, I, I will say this as many times as you can stand to listen to me say it, that does not only apply to your city council, it applies to you too. So these requirements, the Ohio Ethics Commission, and what they overlook, their, their purview in Ohio, this applies to Planning Commission and this applies to BZA. And so you can't use your position, right? Um, your authority of influ or influence of office or employment to secure anything of value or promise of value. This does not just extend to you, this extends to your spouse and your children, Jerry and your parents, and a business partner, right? right. And then I think it's, yeah, and then I think it stops. It's not like, like it, people, I'll get questions from people that are like, my niece works at this company. Well, okay, you can draw the line eventually. But it's, does not just, it's not just you. If you have something in front of you that is going to benefit your wife and her development company greatly, you have a conflict of interest. If you suspect you might have a conflict, oh, I have a little cartoon. My client feels you should recuse yourself as he is a cat person. Um, if you think you might have a conflict of interest, raise the issue, talk about it ahead of time, get some advice from legal counsel if you have access, and then you may need to recuse yourself. Board and commission members tend to get caught up between recusal and abstention, right? And they're two very different things. Abstention, abstaining from a vote, or from abstaining from anything is very simple, right? It's just voluntary, voluntarily refraining from doing something, according to Black's Law. So um, if you missed a meeting and they're approving the minutes at the next meeting and you missed that one, you can abstain from that vote, right? Because you don't need to vote on the meeting minutes for a meeting that you didn't participate in. If you mess that up and you forget to abstain, it's okay. It's not gonna be like any kind of great whatever. But if you think of it, you can abstain from that and say, I was absent from the March meeting, so I'm gonna abstain from the vote on the minutes. Recusal is very different. Recusal is removing yourself. When lawyers talk about recusal generally, right, we're talking about a judge who might have a conflict of interest with, with the parties that are before him or her. But where you're concerned, right, you as the board or commission member may need to recuse yourself if you have a conflict of interest. So if you um, get your packet and you see something in there and you, oh, hey, I know them really well, or I was involved with this in my old job, or whatever it may be, anything that causes you to, and we live in, generally, we live in small towns, right? Uh, the, uh, people in whatever community that you may represent on the Border Commission, you probably know a lot of people in that community and you probably have a lot of community ties. So conflicts come up and it's okay to have a conflict of interest. It's just not okay to still sit there and not recuse yourself and vote on it. Right? If you have a conflict of interest, you need to recuse. Recusal means physically getting up from the dais and walking into the audience and sitting down. You don't have to leave the room. That's not required. Some people do leave the room. I was recently in a meeting and um, one of the council members felt that the conflict of interest that he had you know, required him to actually leave the room and he did and that's fine. So, um, but you don't have to. You can sit in the audience now and observe the meeting and. Um, Technically, you can even speak. That's a whole other issue that we're not going to get into. Talk to your legal counsel. This is not legal advice. So if you, um, if you need to recuse yourself, I would talk to your counsel beforehand if you, ha if you can. I would tell your chair, hey, I'm going to have to recuse myself because I have a conflict of interest on this application. And then when the application gets called, you say, uh, you know, I have to uh, recuse myself from this because I have a conflict of interest. I don't need to give any more than that and get up and step down off the dais and sit down. And do not flag and wave and make you know, faces and gestures at your board, while they're, your fellow board members, while they're deciding to let them know how you would vote. Just sit there. Um, and then you're okay, then that's it, right? No issues. If you don't, uh, this is just more about this, what abstention versus um, recusal is. If you don't, it can raise an issue down the road, right? It could call the whole decision into question. It could call, it could call your ethical um, <coughs> um, interests into question, right? Like that you have now done something that runs um, contrary to what is intended by these statutes and you know, the decisions, which I'm gonna go through several of them from the High Ethics Commission about recusal. So, or about conflicts of interest. So if you think there's an issue, please raise it ahead of time. You know, I'm not, um, opposed to the issue being raised to me two minutes before the meeting starts, but it's not ideal, um, you know, but it, sometimes it happens, right? Sometimes a member may not realize it until the very last second and then they raise the issue. Lawyers are risk adverse, when in doubt recuse, but um, generally. But 
I wanted to mention, because this has come up now in the last probably six months, I've had this issue come up three different times. It's called the mere membership exception. If you belong to a church or a synagogue, or, and you are a member, but not on the board, you're not an employee, you're a member. Now maybe you give them money, right? You throw money into the dish, fine. Participate in fundraisers, okay. You, and then the, the church comes before your commission for whatever. They've got some kind of um, land use application that they've brought to you. You're okay to participate. You do not have to recuse yourself. That is the mere membership exception, right? And the idea is, again, a lot, we were in small towns, right? Everybody knows everybody. People are connected in lots of different ways. And the Ethics Commission in Ohio does not require us to remove ourselves from the consideration just because we might be a member. What happens if you live in a certain subdivision and they're building a subdivision where they might build one next to you? Right. I mean, I mean you're, you're a member of that HOA and it does, sure. it's going to affect you. We're going to get into some examples that address that sort of thing, but generally that's a very gray area. You know, it, it's a gray area. So um, every community has a certain number of feet notice, right? They're going to send out notice of the hearing to people that live within a certain, um, a certain area of, of the application. If you, yes, thank you. If you get that letter, probably should recuse yourself. You're close enough now that arguably, not, and not every time, an argument could be made that you don't have a conflict of interest depending on the facts and circumstances. But if you got the letter, chances are you're gonna wanna recuse yourself. And at the very least, you're gonna wanna reach out and get that, um, review that with the city staff or attorney and just say, hey, I feel like I should step down, what do you think? If you, oh, sure. Um, let's say you uh, aren't sure if you have a conflict. You go talk to the city's attorney and they say, you know, technically we don't think you do. You're still free to recuse yourself. You are still free to recuse yourself. I have yet to chain anyone to their chair. Yes, you're still free to recuse yourself. You, you know, I just had that exam that happened to me a couple weeks ago. I told him he did not have to recuse, that under Ohio ethics law, he was fine to participate. He said, you know, I'm just not comfortable. I'm gonna step down, fine. The appearance of impropriety is a real thing. And no one wants to have that, no one wants their reputation called into question or have something, you know, said about them on the street in the parking lot. Oh, well, she shouldn't have participated because whatever the connection may be, right? So if you feel like you need to recuse yourself, then do. The caveat to that being, if you have a commission of seven and three of them have to recuse because they have a legitimate conflict under Ohio law, and your attorney is telling you you really don't have to, then maybe you, maybe you don't, then there's a fine, then you're in a gray area again, right? There's a fine line there. But usually, yes, I think if you have that feeling, you're gonna step down, and that's fine. If you're a member of a church, you have that option or whatever. What if it's something similar as far as being a member of something but not necessarily a church? Like what I volunteer at the schools a lot. They're um, uh, going to be not, I don't know if they're going to be coming to the zoning building, but they're going to be asking for things, the new equipment and stuff. Right. Probably not, but maybe that mere membership ex exception has a very specific definition. And the only time I've touched it in the last um, six months has been for churches and synagogues. So I don't. I just don't know. I'd have to look at that language and see. But chances are, you'd be okay. Yeah, I believe I believe organizations like that may be included in the definition, but I don't know for sure. So again, you'd ha you just have to get legal counsel. You'd have to get some advice, um, and they'd be, they'd be able to find out um, f for you. They'd be able to, to get the, the um, conclusive answer on that. Did I flip forward? No. OK. Any other questions on that? Um, you're prohibited from participating in a matter, right, where the relationship between you and the other person, the applicant, whoever, um, could, is going to impair your judgment, right? If you, if you can't be impartial, you can't participate, right? If you have a conflict of interest, step down. The facts of this one, and now I'm going to need my notes, because I wrote down some of these facts of some of these ethics commission decisions, and some of them might be interest. Well, I mean, interesting is a relative term, right? But some of them might be useful to us. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, part of this, they decided, the ethics commission decided that this, the, oh, when it says advisory opinion, that means from the Ohio Ethics Commission. Uh, one of the questions here had to do with relationships that the um, board member had with a bank 
that was bef coming before them. And the Ethics Commission ultimately decided that was a conflict of interest. But the first question of this one was, um, the wife sat on city council, the husband sat on planning commission, Planning Commission served in a, you know, a role of recommending things to city council, right? And so they posed it to the Ethics Commission, is it a conflict of interest for the wife to decide on something that had been recommended by planning when husband had been part of the recommendation at the, at the commission level? And the Ethics Commission said no, that is not a conflict of interest. But it even amused me that that, that, that got raised. And you could see how that would happen, right? If they're sitting at home annoyed at each other because council didn't approve something planning recommended or vice versa. Um, so, all right, you're, again, these are all along the very same vein to give you the idea of what you should be thinking about and what you're going to be looking for if you might have a conflict of interest. So you need to be looking for, you have to, you have to recuse yourself if you have a particular and definite pecuniary benefit or detriment. This is where things get interesting, right? If you have something that's happening across town and it's gonna affect everybody in the town. Everyone's annoyed about the traffic. Everyone's annoyed about whatever it is, whatever it may be. If it affects everyone the same way, then generally no one needs to recuse themselves, right? Because you don't have any definite or particular benefit or detriment specific to you. I think this might even be, um, somewhere in here I have actual examples of this. Okay, like this one. So the council or the commission member on this one was not able to participate in a vote to widen a road which passed right in front of his property right? But he was able to vote on a water treatment plant that was near his property, but that was going to benefit the whole community. So these are the distinctions, right, between when you're looking for that definite and particular benefit. Sometimes if it's something that's going to benefit everyone the same way or, if, or to everyone's detriment the same way, then you may not have a conflict of interest. It's something you're going to need to raise ahead of time and talk to legal counsel about. Um, again, there's too many words on these slides. This is about um, when you can participate in the purchase of property. Um, if, you're in, if you have an interest in it or if you're connected to it some way, then um, you, know, you need to be careful about what the, um, what the impact would be to you, both benefit or detriment. The rezoning for the next one about the CIC, planning commissioner is a trustee of the CIC. In this case, the ethics commission said that he could still participate because his benefit was accruing, the benefit to it was accruing to the whole city, not just to him. Any more questions on conflicts of interest before we move on? Yeah, I'm on the BZA and a factory is going in across the street from me and I'm the only resident across from me. I recuse myself, then I'm prohibited from making my comments known. I would speak to your legal counsel. I would speak to your legal counsel. So there's case law out there that says that a board or commission member, a council member, is not stripped of their constitutional right to participate as a citizen just because they sit on a board or a commission. So generally, a, somebody who needs to recuse themselves still has a right to speak. There's nuances. So I would, if you have access to a, um, your city attorney, your township counselor, whoever, I would talk to them. Just have your wife speak for me. I was just about to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I was just about to say that. Precedent. Yeah, right, right. Um, okay, ex parte communications. So lawyers love Latin, right? This is what we talk about with judges. Lawyers will say, you know, you can't, a judge can't talk, if I'm, the, if I'm the plaintiff in a case, judge can't talk to me without the defendant in the room. Well, or defendant's counsel in the room. Well, ex parte communications where you're concerned work a similar way. You can't have conversations with the applicant that you're not having, you know, in front of everyone, in front of neighbors or, or community members that may be opposed or whoever else needs to be involved in that conversation. You should not be talking to them um, separate and apart from, from that meeting. Those conversations should be had in open meeting. This, a lot of this stuff is extremely awkward, right? It's hard to walk through the grocery store and have somebody you know well walk up to you and say, hey, you're on the planning commission. I'm gonna be in front of you because I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z on my property and say, sorry, let's not talk about that. You know, it just wouldn't be appropriate. But you really should say that to them in the way, the nicest way possible. I, I'm gonna have to wait and talk about it at the meeting. You know, be sure you're, um, you know, able to attend and get, get there, and if you have people that are there supporting you, bring them along, whatever it may be, you can give them the idea of how to help them along if you have, you know, if you know that they need to, um, 
maybe if they'd be helpful to have neighbors involved or things like that. That's all fine, right? But don't talk about the case. Don't talk about their application. That can run um, afoul of issues. And then definitely don't talk about you talking about that in the meeting, because <laughs> that's a bad idea too. Um, yes? So, um, we are working on a housing plan, Riola's plan, because I'm on our village council and our planning commission. So as part of that work, we want to look at areas that can be developed to talk to the landowner, uh, <coughs> find out what they're interested in doing, find out how the village might work with them, and to look at the kind of incentives we might do in a housing plan to support the kind of housing we want. As long as they have not yet come to planning commission with a application, is that okay to talk to them? I would talk to your legal counsel. There's a lot of facts in there that are specific to the situation. And I, before I would give an opinion on that, I'd want all the facts. So I would, um, I'd probably give him a call. For this community, I can say him because it's a dude. So yeah, I would, I would do that. You know, you just sometimes you can uh, run afoul of things before you even realized you did it, or sometimes it's totally fine. <coughs> and um, yeah, I would, I, would, I would call him and discuss it. Examples of ex parte communication, this is easy enough, right? Phone calls, letters, personal visits, emails. Emails are important. Um, not bad practice at all to forward emails that you get onto whoever the person is, the clerk, or um, you know, the, whoever the administrative assistant is that's gonna be assisting during the meetings. You can forward those emails onto them and let them become part of the record. So rather than you yourself being the only member that saw something, it can be either read into the record, um, or if they have it it's, um, enough in advance, it become part of the packet, perhaps. So you know, forwarding that stuff along is always a good idea. Oh, and, and try not to reply, right, and engage in conversations. Thank you for the information, it's fine. Right, but um, anything more than that, you're just going to want to wait for the hearing. Okay, legislative versus administrative. A little while ago, when we were talking about exec sessions, and Jerry said, "Yeah, I mean, you know, BZAs can do what they do because they're kind of acting as judges." That's a really important point because BZAs typically, always, almost, and in variance hearing for sure, are acting in an administrative capacity. If you're on planning commission, you may go back and forth. You may sometimes be in an administrative capacity, you may be sometimes be in a legislative capacity. So um, typically in Ohio, legislative is enacting a law, <coughs> administrative is applying it. Um, your legal counsel will be able to tell you the difference in which one you're in. And why does it matter? Well, most of the time when you're in these hearings, it's not gonna matter. You're probably, if you're in a commission that's hearing both, uh, for example, here in the city of Centerville, unless things have changed, but I don't believe they have, they don't have a BZA. Is anyone here from Centerville? Andrew left. Um, okay, so there's no BZA, right? It's all planning commission. And the planning commission here tends to be very sophisticated, I'm not just saying this because you're in the front row, tends to be a very sophisticated board and they, and they switch hats back and forth beautifully. They typically know, they have great legal counsel, they typically know what um, capacity they're in at any given time. Uh, some boards and commissions don't understand it necessarily as fluently. If you're new, it can sound very strange. Uh, we recently had a situation with um, a community of mine that was hearing a conditional use on something that was very, very um, contested by the neighbors, right? People were really invested in this and very opposed to it. But the reasons that they were opposed to it weren't relevant to the consideration of the board. So when you're legislative, you have an application in front of you for a rezoning, and half the town shows up, standing room only, and they all want their three minutes. Fine, Every, of course, they talk, they tell you everything they think, they tell you why this is a terrible idea, or a great injustice, or whatever it may be, right? And all of that is part of the process. That's all part of the legislative process. As you legislate and make new laws, which is what a rezoning in Ohio is considered to be, then you need to be hearing from everyone and letting them give, their, get, letting them give you their, um, their particular input, whatever it may be. I mean, it's okay to say things like, please don't just say the same things over and over again, but people ignore that. They're gonna say what they wanna say regardless, right? Um, so when you're in an administrative role, it's different. So this, this community recently that was hearing this um, conditional use, they were in an administrative role, they knew they were gonna hear from dozens of property owners that were gonna say, this is it, this is, all, this is the end of, all of life as we know it if you pass this, if you allow this. That's not relevant to the decision that they're making. 
on a conditional use and on a variance, you are limited to what is evidence in front of you. I'm getting ahead of myself, I have lots of slides on all of this, we're not gonna get to any of it, so I'll just do it all now. That's not relevant to what's in front of you. You need to work with the, when you're in an administrative capacity, you are a judge, right? And you can only, judges can only rule, should only rule on the evidence in front of them. So when you're in that administrative capacity, you need to hear the evidence and you need to rule on the evidence. And if you've got a lot of neighbors getting up and saying, I, sh I mean, I say neighbors, we're talking about people that really live far away from where this use was gonna go in. They're getting up and saying, this is terrible and it's the end of civilization as we know it. That's not evidence. Evidence in those circumstances are the people that live right next door, right? The people that are within that, um, within that area of, of notice, the people that can say, this affects me directly because X, Y, Z, right? But if it's just people that wanna get up and say, medical marijuana is the end of everything in Ohio, that's not evidence. That doesn't come into consider, and I just gave away what the conditional use was that we were hearing, right? That, that's not, I mean, it's all public, it happened out in the, trust me, it happened in the public. Um, so that's not evidence in front of them. So in that conditional use hearing, on that medical marijuana dispensary, after all of those people talked, and they had done their research, and they'd written talking points, and they were emotional, and I get it, I get it. I wouldn't want a medical marijuana dispensary in my backyard either, I suppose. I had to say to the board, okay, listen, this is the evidence in front of you. The applicant gave you their evidence. Staff gave you that, what you get from staff. That's considered evidence. It's all part of the record. Um, there were four property owners that live here, here, and here, and here, and here. They have proper standing to come in front of you and talk about this issue. Consider what they told you. The rest of it is public input that is not considered relevant to the evidence in front of you for this record for this decision. And nobody wants to hear that, right? I mean, the commission didn't want to hear that. Well, I mean, they handled it great. They're very, it's a great commission out there. But the citizens certainly don't want to hear me say that. Disregard everything everyone just told you for the last two hours. But that's the realities of it. And when you're in an administrative capacity, if you're ruling on a variance, conditional use, some other things, you need to stick to the record. You need to stick to the evidence. And public comment is not evidence. Ohio courts have ruled on it. It's not a popular position to take. Years ago, I had a, a chairperson in a BZA that I used to attend that would not let anyone speak if they didn't have standing. And he would sit there standing. If they didn't have a particular involvement in this, that there was more than just public comment, he would sit there as chair and he would make a decision on every single person that came to that podium. Okay, what's your name? Where do you live or work or whatever it was? What's your, okay, no, you don't have standing, sit down. That's. I mean, it, he handled it well, and I think generally he always made the right call. It's not a common practice. It's not something that any, does anybody in here do that? Does any of your boards operate that way, that somebody has to prove they have standing before they speak? Yeah, it's just not something, and it, plus it's a big burden on the chair, right, to do that in the moment and in the meeting, and people don't like it. They want to be able to talk. And a sophisticated board that's had good legal counsel can say, all right, here's what we have to decide. That I, I understand all of these people don't want it. And I hear them, and I get it, but it's not part of the record. We have to look at this, this, and this, right? Any questions on that? Um, okay, so we've, I've talked about all of this. This is tests about when something is legislative, when something is administrative. Um, and again, more case law, which just makes people's eyes glaze over. And this is all the law in Ohio over the years that set all these tests up that we just discussed building a record. So this is where, you know, when you're in that administrative capacity, you know how I said if you're administrative versus legislative, it dictates how you can get sued? If you're in administrative capacity, if you're hearing that variance, then the way you'll get sued, probably, if you do something that somebody doesn't like, either the applicant or the person, people that were opposed to it, um, is by a 2506 appeal. And 2506 is simply in reference to a section of the Ohio Revised Code. And that 2506 appeal is a really cool little mechanism that turns the, the, the court, the trial court, it turns the trial court into a court of appeals. And now you were the trial court, right? So your board, your BZA heard the variance and you denied it. And the applicant appealed under 2506. Now the, court, now the trial court has become your court of appeals. And that's how they're going to handle it. They're going, to give you, they're going to give your decision deference as an appellate court would to a lower court, right? 
You're the one that heard the evidence. The court's going to say that. Hey, they heard the evidence. I wasn't there. So there's deference to your decision in a 2506 appeal. And if you did it right, the only thing the judge is going to look at is the record of that meeting, what went on that night. And doing it right are things that are up here. You swear in witnesses, right? You um, think about the fact that if you're in that 2506 capacity, you need to keep things to the evidence that's in front of you. You're not going to wander off into a path that says, well, I hear a lot of people here telling me that medical marijuana um, is a bad thing because of what happened in Colorado or Oregon or whatever. So no, if you, you stick to the record, chair needs to be involved in these decisions, and the chair can correct people and say, that, that's a great point. And I, and I hear you, I, and, and we heard it from the public, that's right. But remember, that's not the evidence that's in front of us. The evidence that's in front of us is this application, this expert, whatever the evidence is that they've given you, information from staff. And if you, do, if you play your cards right, and you stay within the confines of where you're supposed to be in that hearing, then when you go up on appeal, if, you're, if you get sued, 2506 appeal in the trial court, they'll keep everything that the judge considers will be kept to the record that was in front of you that night. It makes things easier. Um, it helps with that deferential um, treatment of your decision making. And um, ultimately, for the city, it can save you a lot of money. Because if 2506 appeals aren't kept just to the record, uh, then you get into a more traditional litigation situation where you have discovery and could have depositions, and you can wander off in all sorts of directions. I was just going to say, most of the people here are going to have you with the team. And so you're not going to have a person that's going to say, everything you just heard is really nice, but I'm considering. And what the worst thing that could happen is you have all the people come in there talking about the excessive traffic that's totally made up or whatever. If nobody challenges them on that or says anything else about it, and then, OK, everybody's done. Public hearing is closed. That's why I have a motion. There's nothing on the record that everyone says, no, 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 no. Then the person who doesn't like the decision is going to say, they base their decision on all that garbage, which is reasonable and arbitrary, they need to be overruled. And so when you have these people that are talking totally off top, the chair, I've said a couple of them that do that, they, at the end, they remind their board of what the standards are that they're looking for. And just that one little statement can just save you a lot of cost of litigation. And that idea, let me get to the slide. That idea is so important. So, okay, when we start talking about variances, who's, sorry, raise your hand if you're on BZA. Okay, a fair few of you. Okay, BZA, you're gonna hear variance. You, and if you're on planning commission, you may hear variances too, depending on the way PUDs work and whatever. You, you may still hear them too. Variances have standards. If you know, if the word Duncan standards means something to you, great. Then that means that your zoning code has incorporated the seven factors set forth by the Ohio Supreme Court in the Duncan versus Middlefield case that um, this is the Ohio Supreme Court saying this is how you should look at a variance. You should use these seven standards. If you've never heard the word Duncan, then that doesn't necessarily matter. As long as your staff report spells out for you the fact that the decision standards that you need to take, what Jerry was just saying, the decision standards that you need to address, right? So you've had a lot of noise. The public hearing went on for hours. People talked and talked and talked. And now it's decision time. And you've got the decision standards in front of you. Use them. Let them guide you. Talk about every single one of them. And try to be careful when you talk about each decision standard, try to be careful to use the evidence that was in front of you and not the public comment. If you have a lot of people, after person after person after person, standing up and saying, the traffic is going to be so awful, that's probably not evidence. If you have someone stand up and say, hey, I own the business next door, and I had a traffic study done, and here's a copy of my traffic study, and it shows this, that, and the other, this is evidence, right? You've got somebody who's directly affected, they've, taken, they've provided you with the information, and it's not just public comment or speculation. So when you go through your standards, if they're Duncan standards, great. If they're not Duncan standards, it's okay. They may still be some variation of it. No, it there's nothing that compels you to use them. Uh, though typically, this is what you're seeing more and more in zoning codes. Go through your standards. Same thing's true for a conditional use. You don't want to be 
um, wandering around discuss discussing things with no direction. If you're a chairperson, know your direction. Know what your standards are and stick to your standards. Okay, great. Public hearing's closed. Now we need to, we need to discuss it and we're gonna remember this is what our code says and we are bound by our code. We gotta stick here. And now, Typically, there's a catch, there could be a catch-all, right? There could be something that says anything else that's relevant or something along those lines. Okay, yeah, that could be gray, but maybe there's something that needs to be discussed that's outside the bounds of just the specific decision standards. But generally, they're gonna get you where you need to be. As you walk through the standards, talk about the evidence and address each and every one of them. Then, if you get sued, knock on wood, right? Then you're on appeal when the judge, well, whoever's doing the, review is gonna read through it and see, okay, these are their standards, they addressed all of them, they saw this evidence supporting this and this evidence supporting this, and then they voted, you know, in whatever way they voted. And it's okay to, you're gonna be weighing these standards, nothing is 100% conclusive. None of the, each standard, there's not a single one that every single time needs to be met to grant it or doesn't need to be met or whatever. They're, they can be weighed, they are very fact specific, and so in each hearing, you're gonna go through all of them and discuss the, uh, the evidence that was put in front of you. Let me back up a little bit here because I do wanna talk about use, and I've only got 15 minutes left, so we're gonna barrel through some of this. Um, use versus area variances. So um, area variances are much more common. Generally, that's what you're gonna see, and area variances are also referred to as a dimensional variance. These are the ones that are for setback or lot coverage, or you know, they, um, for whatever reason, they don't have enough frontage, and so they're coming to you to say, hey, technically my lot has to be this wide to do what I wanna do, and it's only this wide, but here's why you should still let me. Um, and area variances are governed by your code, like I was just talking about. That's where the Duncan standards come in. Follow your code go through your standards, talk about the evidence. Use variances are different. Uh, they're exactly what they sound like. They're a variance from the uses that are allowed on that property. <coughs> not a lot of, I shouldn't say not a lot. A lot of communities do not allow use variances. They're disallowed by code. So it's just dependent upon your community. You'll have to find out whether they're allowed or not. If one comes up in front of you, then chances are they're allowed by your code, right? If it came through staff and was presented to you. So use variances have a much higher standard they are um, under the courts, as the courts have, have analyzed them, if you, for a use variance, you as a property owner or an applicant, you have to establish unnecessary hardship. You basically have to prove that you can't do anything with this property unless you're given this use variance, right? That you're gonna be, de you're gonna be denied all, the, all use, reasonable use of that property without, um, without that variance. So they come in, you'll have your standards, they make their application, you hear your evidence and you rule. Same thing for area variances. Um, these are the routine ones. These are the ones that the vast majority of variances that you see are gonna have to do with this. And there's the Duncan standards, right? So if you're on a BZA and you hear variances, hopefully these sound fit relatively familiar um, and along the lines of the things that you're talking about in every single variance hearing. Even if it's 11 o'clock at night, and you've already heard four of them, still go through your standards, right? Hear your evidence, go through your standards. Um, and I've, obviously I've shortened them for the slide, but um, you get the general idea, right? Can they, um, do they, is there a reasonable return on the property without the variance? Um, is there a substantial detriment to the neighbors? Is the variance substantial? I'd love to tell you that I can find conclusive law in Ohio on what is a substantial percentage. Never really narrowed that down. There's some cases that will speak to a person, because you know, sometimes staff will give you a percentage. They'll say this is whatever it is, a 20% variance or whatever. What is substantial? Fact specific, right? It depends on each application that's in front of you. What might be substantial in one circumstance isn't in another. Um, did the property owner purchase it with knowledge of the issue? Okay, yes, you're gonna, all, this are all things you need to work through and talk about other, other solutions and substantial justice. So. Um, if you have a contested variance hearing, people are bent out of shape, but you are, it's in front of you and you've got the evidence, work through your standards, have the conversation, talk about the evidence, and sometimes you just have to approve it, sometimes you have to deny it. Depends on where it falls, fact specific. Okay, I have some case law um, examples in here. I have been using this case in presentations since it was decided in 2012, mostly because I love that picture which is just one I pulled offline um, because it was a woman that was talked about in the case. But um, Kaylor versus Westchester Township, this was an issue of 
a sign variance. Um, have you ever driven by these, like Liberty Tax? They put these people out on the road. My kids think they're hilarious. They put these people out on the road to get attention to bring you in to do your taxes, right? So um, Westchester Township got bent out of shape, gave them, um, a, cited them with a violation of the sign code. And um, so the Liberty Tax people, Kalor LLC, that was the company that owned it, they um, applied for a sign code variance and came before the BZA and it was denied. And then they went on to sue them. I think this case is so helpful to any BZA member that I've ever convinced to read it because it, the, the court on this case had no qualms, right? They went through the standards. They said, hey, we're going to give this BZA deference. They were there. They, saw the ev they heard the evidence. They went through the standards and the board handled it beautifully. They went through each and every one of them, and they addressed all the standards. They used the evidence that was in front of them, and it worked out. I mean, in the end, the court was like, yeah, fine, done. The BZA did the right thing. Um, what I think is extremely funny about this case is that one of the issues was that she was too big for the sign code. So can you imagine being that woman, and there's a case out there that talks about <laughs> that your uh, yeah, size was, was too big for the sign code. But anyway, um, it, it's a great case. If you ever had the time to Google it, pull it up and read through it, it does, it does give some great. There's other weird nuances in there. Um, there's some, it, the ledges to the fact that maybe they should never have come in for the sign code variance, right? What they should have done, according to the court, was maybe tell Westchester Township she's not a sign and argued it that way. But that's not what they did. They applied for the variance and then they appealed it. So the court stayed within the confines of what was in front of them. So um, anyway, so these last cases that are on here about variances are, um, I don't know of anything of great import beyond what we've already discussed. This, is, this case is extremely important only in that it was one of the first that analyzed the, oh wait, Kissel, it was one of the first that analyzed these area variances and really gave a lot of thought to how a board should be working through them um, and whether it should be, um, whether the variance should have been approved. I think that, I don't love the way this case is applied sometimes in real life because the court made some comments in there about neighboring property owners had also been, a, had also applied for similar variances and the board had, had granted them. And then the court seemed to give that some, they, the court did give that some weight, right? That the, the properties around there had been granted similar variances and then the board didn't grant it to this one. So I get a quest, this question a lot in, um, in meetings, especially BZA meetings on variances where people will ask me about precedent. And they'll say, okay, well, so we had, whatever, 320 West Walnut come before us two months ago. And it was very similar to this. And we granted that variance. So now does that set precedent and does that require us to grant this variance? And my answer to that is always going to be no, right? The answer is always that stay within the four corners of what's in front of you. Use the evidence in front of you, analyze this case based on this property and this application. The problem with that is, you know, there's um, and a standard that's going to be applied if you get sued. One of the questions is, was the board arbitrary? And so property owners can argue this was arbitrary, right? Because they gave it to 320 West Walnut, but then they didn't give it to me. So that does, I think, tend to um, cut against my always consistent answer of no, that did not set precedent, stay within the confines of the application that's in front of you. But I don't know how else to grapple that or, or walk that line or, or, or work through that gray area because you, you can't, it's, it's not evidence. What happened elsewhere is not the evidence of the case in front of you. We'll go through your standards, hear about this property, hear from the neighbors if they're there, whatever, work within the confines of what's in front of you. So this case was appealed? No, this is law. This is Ohio Supreme Court law. Right, so did they, they Oh, oh, you mean how did the case, yes. The, it's not clear. The, I know, this slide is not clear at all. The, um, see, that's to keep you guessing. <laughs> <laughs> the BZA denied it and the court said they needed a grant it, that they, that they were arbitrary. Ultimately, the Supreme Court said it was an arbitrary so decision. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I. Um, but so not for a reason you like. There were other reasons too. Okay. There were other reasons too. They they didn't like the fact. I think it's Kissel. Let me look at my notes. Where the um, board talked about prior uses, and the court did not like that. Um, no, that's the next case. On this one, they just yeah they talked about the fact that it had been granted elsewhere and that they thought that the commission or the BZA hadn't gone through their standards in a way that 
um, would have upheld the, um, the decision to deny it. So it is what it is, and that's how that case gets used when you have an appeal against a community um, is that, hey, you granted it down the road. So this case is just kind of fun um, because the property was weird. It was, a, it was like a bowling alley lot kind of thing, and um, working within the confines of the property, this, the applicant wanted to uh, tear down the structure that was there that was a shoe repair shop and build a tavern. And the board spent way too much time, per the court, talking about the fact that they didn't want another tavern. Now, when you have an application for a variance in front of you, the ultimate use is not part of the evidence, right? Like, you've got to be looking at, I mean, it can be if there's issues, if you can make, if there's distinctions about um, governmental services or, or um, access or whatever, maybe, but generally, what this board did here, what the Cleveland BZA did in this case was they listened to a council member who showed up and talked about all of the you know, bad deeds that were going on in this area and how this tavern, if they put it in, would cause, um, you know, cause problems to even be exacerbated. And so the court was like, no, this is not relevant. You don't need to be talking about the fact that you don't want people drinking in this building. That's not relevant. Uh, stick to your standards. So um, this is an important part that I, that I really want to um, hit home, is that the applicant, when they come before you for a variance, sometimes when I see new board members to a BZA, they're almost inclined to think that the applicant is asking for approval to break the law, right? And, and don't look at it that way. They're not doing anything wrong. Variances exist for a really good reason, right? Because zoning codes don't apply perfectly in every situation. And variances, especially area variances, are like an escape valve, right, on that pressure that, that can come down when the code overlaying on a particular property causes an unreasonable um, and an unnecessary outcome. And maybe the applicant can say, hey, you know, I, I need to do this because of this reason, and I don't think it's crazy. Can you maybe just help me out here and grant me this variance? They're not doing anything wrong, don't, usually, right? Sometimes you'll have people come in front of you that did it, and now they're asking for forgiveness instead of permission. That's annoying, and I get it. Still just go through your standards, right? But um, generally speaking, when someone's applying for an area of variance, try not to approach it as though they're coming at you for something that, um, that they shouldn't, that's illicit, that they shouldn't be allowed to have, right? Um, you may hear appeals from your staff. So there are certain decisions under zoning codes that are made administratively by your, by your zoning staff, planning staff, and then um, sometimes there's a mechanism for that to be appealed to you. Whenever this happens, boards are always like, what is this? Whoa, what's going on here, right? Because it's weird and it's different. Um, but if it happens, there's going to be something set forth in your code that'll help guide you, and um, you're going to hear why, whatever the reason is, the applicant thinks that they got it wrong and why you should overturn the decision of your staff. So follow your code. Conditional uses, which I have like two minutes to talk about. Sorry about that. Um, conditional uses are, let's get to the meat of it. I don't need any of this. They are not a right. It probably says somewhere in your zoning code that you are not compelled, you don't have to grant a conditional use, right? You're allowed to hear from the applicant about what use they want and why they want it. Clearly, if it's been considered as a conditional use and listed in your zoning code, it's been contemplated for the property, so they're not coming out of left field. But it's not necessarily um, a right, right? You have to determine whether or not it's compatible with surrounding uses. You have to um, decide whether or not it's going to, you know, what the effect is going to be on the neighboring properties. That's all very relevant <coughs> and important, and you should be listening to that. Um, let me get to. So um, this one was Shelley Materials. This case went all the way to the Supreme Court, the Ohio Supreme Court, and they decided the court decided that the applicant, you know, the, one of the things that they make the point of in this, which is the law in Ohio, is that the burden is on the applicant. Right? They have to establish that the use is compatible. The burden is not on the neighbor. The burden is on the applicant to establish that it is compatible. If anybody wants any of these cases after tonight, I'd be happy to email them to you. I didn't put my email on the first slide. That's very unlike me. You can find me at coollaw.com. Not a cutesy name, an old Western Union handle. Um, so, but I mean, also kind of a cutesy name. Um, and then a couple of township cases that are in here as well. Um, in this case, they wanted to subdivide and um, there was issues with the drainage. This case is interesting because the court did uphold the board and the board relied really heavily on neighboring property owners' input 
but also there were some issues. The court poked some holes in the evidence that was presented by the applicant. Um, but they did, they did give quite a bit of deference in here to neighboring property owners and their concerns. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop because we have exactly one minute left. And if anybody has any burning desire to ask questions, I'd like to hear them. Anything? Oh. I have a question. I, I couldn't hear the tail end of your presentation. Oh, we really? We didn't spend a lot of time, me, we didn't spend a lot of time on hardship. We end up debating a lot on where <coughs> hardship starts and stops. If Wendy's Corporation says you need to have these signs as a franchise owner, and we say that that's too much signage for your property, is the hardship that he's not compliant with his corporate? Word is, hardship is a tough thing to debate. You didn't use that word very often. That's because hardship isn't the law in Ohio on an area variance. So a sign code variance that you're talking about is an area variance, and that is a practical difficulty standard. So if your code is imposing a hardship standard on the applicant, um, then that's something you might want to bring up with your legal counsel and, and address that a little bit further. The, the hardship is something I touch on exactly never, because none of my communities allow air, um, sorry use variances. And that is a use variance concept. Also, I can tell you for, by experience that we had a Taco Bell franchise and the board was like, sorry, no. And they still have their franchise and they have their menu boards. So. Uh, they didn't get their signs and they're still in business. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. Have a great night. <laughs>